Um, I'm going to be talking about um, events that happened in uh, not very far from some of the places that uh, Natalie was talking about. Um, I haven't been on field trips there. I've, I've done all my research here in Orkney, but um, uh, I see some uh, some names reappearing. Um, so I want really just to to introduce you to a body of archival material which is held here in Orkney, but which concerns um, what happened in North Russia uh, in the uh, Russian Civil War, and just suggest some of the ways that that uh, body of material can be used for research. So just to um, give a bit of context, the connections between um, Orkney and North Russia at uh, this, uh, this time, well, there, there, there are several of them. Um, First of all, the, uh, the HMS Hampshire, which was sunk just off the west coast of Orkney near Marwick Head on the 5th of June 1916, uh, and is the subject of an exhibition at Stromness Museum uh, this year. Um, of course, it's famous because Lord Kitchener was aboard, um, and he was on his way to Archangel, uh, to Archangelsk, to um, negotiate with the, uh, the, the Tsar and his officials, because of course at this time, Russia uh, was an ally of Britain in the fight against Germany. And also another little connection, on Armistice Day itself, the 11th of November 1918, um, there were people in Kirkwall on their way to Russia. I'll just read you a description of this from um, Clifford Kinvig's book, Churchill's Crusade, which is the most thorough book published so far on the British involvement in North Russia in this period. In the small city of Kirkwall, the capital of the Orkney Islands, the bells of the ancient cathedral of St Magnus rang out and all the ships in the crowded harbour and standing out to sea sounded a deafening salute to the end of the conflict. In less than half an hour, flags were flying all over the town as the little community of farmers and fisherfolk shared in the nation's elation. There were also large numbers of temporary and rather shaken visitors to Kirkwall that day who greeted the news as something less than the relief their Western Front comrades, or the joy of the islanders around them. These visitors were a shipload of almost 3,000 officers and men on their way to Russia as reinforcements for the garrison at Murmansk. So this was the, the ship they were sailing on, the, um, the Majesty's, His Majesty's Transport, Trasos Montes, um, which was actually a German passenger liner which had been commandeered by the Portuguese at the beginning of the war and then loaned to the British and their ship was under repair at Kirkwall at the time of the armistice, but they were on their way to continue fighting uh, in Russia. Because um, after the revolution in 1917, Russia withdrew from the, uh, from the war. The British, who were already in place um, supporting the Russians, remained where they were because they were very concerned that the Germans would seize Murmansk, which is a potential uh, submarine base, and also that they would uh, get to Archangel where there was a large supply of war material that the British had supplied to the Imperial Army and which was, uh, was still there in Archangel. So the British didn't withdraw and as a result they were treated by the Bolsheviks as foreign invaders and um, at the time of the armistice on the Western Front, Britain and Bolshevik Russia were uh, uh, engaged in an undeclared war uh, up in North Russia. So. Um, the man I'm going to talk about who came into this conflict was H.W. Scarf. Um, born in London in 1899, um, Henry William Scarf was known uh, locally as, as Henry Willie. People still talk about Henry Willie. Uh, within the, his family, he was known as Billy Scarf. His mother was German. His father was an Orcadian, uh, Pillen Scarf, connected to the Scarf, Barry, and Watt families, uh, major landowning families in Orkney. And particularly they were closely related to the Watt family who were the lairds of Breckness um, uh, with a home at Scale House um, next to Scarabray. And um, so young Billy Scarth spent a lot of time uh, in Orkney. Um, from his childhood, we have this lovely scrapbook where he did little uh, watercolour sketches of the flags of all nations, um, including the the flag of Imperial Russia and the saltire of the Russian Navy. Um, now we have all these papers and all the other papers I'm going to talk about because um, H.W. Scarth in 1929 was to become the Laird of Breckness 
and lived at Scale House then until his death in 1972. And all his papers are now part of the, the Brecknets Estate archive, uh, which I'm uh, responsible for. Now, at the time of the outbreak of war, Scarth was still too young to fight, but in 1917 he joined the Edinburgh University Officer Training Corps. And from there, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Scots Guards at the beginning of 1918. This is a photograph of him in uniform taken somewhere in Orkney, somewhere on the, on the coast. I can't quite identify that particular rock formation, but uh, probably somewhere like uh, Yesmeli. And um, he was then spent several, uh, well, spent some more time training and eventually was sent out to France uh, in 1918 to fight on the Western Front. He was there for a very brief period because in September 1918 he was sent home sick and was still on sick leave at the time of the armistice. But then he ended up in Russia. Well, why? Um, well, I mentioned that um, at the time of the armistice, um, there were British soldiers still on their way uh, to North Russia. And in fact, the 11th of November 1918 was, was the, the bloodiest day of fighting in the North Russia campaign. Um, there was a, a battle around tool gas on the northern Dvina River, the river that flows north um, into the White Sea at Archangel. By that stage, the, the British troops who were there were, couldn't be withdrawn because um, the White Sea was frozen. So the, they were forced to fight a, a winter campaign. Um, and as the spring of 1919 came along, it was decided um, to, to relieve them, to send yet more troops out there. So two relief brigades were sent. And since the war was officially over, they had to be uh, volunteers. So a call was sent out to all the men who were being de demobilized in Britain to see if anyone wanted to volunteer to go to Russia. Uh, Scarf volunteered, possibly he simply felt that he wanted more action. He hadn't spent very, time, very much time on the Western Front. He may have wanted to um, make more use of his military training. Perhaps at this time he was considering a military career and wanted more combat experience. It also occurs to me that um, as a, 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 a gentry um, uh, figure, as a, as a potential laird, um, with German ancestry, he may have felt more com comfortable fighting the communists in Russia than he had been uh, fighting the Germans. In any case, he set off on the 28th of May, 1919, on another of these um, seized German transport ships, the HMT Porto. Uh, he sailed from South Shields to Archangel. So of course they sailed past Orkney and up the west coast of Norway and ran into the White Sea just as the ice was, was breaking up. And he records this in his diary. Uh, June the 4th, entered White Sea. Entrance choked with loose ice. Glare of ice very hard on the eyes. Saw a small boat in the distance, icebound. Supposed to reach Archangel at six tonight, but at the rate we're moving, about six to eight knots, we'll hardly get there till tomorrow. The cold, not nearly so extreme, and the sea as smooth as glass. And the photograph on the left, um, most of the photographs I'm going to show you are, are Scarth's own pictures, um, shows you this passage through the White Sea as the ice was breaking up. Scarth had volunteered to be assigned to the Slavo-British Legion, which was um, a brigade of Russian, um, uh, mainly former members of the Imperial Army and Navy, who were serving under British command. Um, there was no vacancy for someone of his rank and experience at the time in the Slavo British Legion. So instead, he was uh, seconded to the Russian army itself, um, to the 3rd North Russian Rifle Regiment, and served with them for three months along the northern Dvina River. He was involved in three battles at Topsa in June, Selmenga in July, and then Lipovets in August. And this is a photograph of uh, Billy Scarf uh, at Lipovets. Um, and, and then, in the course of September and October, the British were finally withdrawn, uh, and he was uh, evacuated back to, to Britain, uh, ending his brief military career as, a, as an acting captain. So as I said, we, we have a large archive of material that he brought back with him, of various different kinds. Now, the British Army is very bureaucratic, and um, 
Billy Scarf kept almost every bit of paper, it seems, that, that he was given. Um, so we have some, some typed orders like this one on the left, which is the, uh, the order assigning him to the North Russian Rifles um, as, a, as a liaison officer. So his job was to, to, to be the connection between um, the British who were leading the, who were in the overall command of the uh, both British and Russian forces, to be the connection between the British and the Russian soldiers on the ground. Um, it says this posting will give you experience of Russians and uh, one of the uh, very, very marked characteristics of this campaign is that the, the British um, found the Russians, particularly the Russian army, very very alien. Um, the, the British saw the Russians as um, disorganised, ill-disciplined, romantic, um, as the British, sorry, the Russians saw the British as um, over-cautious, over-technical, um, and of course lacking the, the zeal that the, the white Russians themselves had. Um, uh, and so there was a great culture clash going on there. But also Scarf kept little handwritten notes like this one, just a simple movement order, um, and even kept the envelope that that was, was given him. So quite a lot of these sort of army papers. Also, one of the themes that's been coming out of a lot of papers today is, is, is mapping the north. You brought back a number of maps. Uh, these photographs are by Rebecca Marr, the photographer from Stromness, who's um, photographed uh, all our artifacts at the Scale House. Um, on the left, we have a blueprint map um, printed by uh, the British Army, but um, annotated by Billy Scarth. I don't know if you can make it out. Um, he's there's little red ink annotations on there. Um, and he actually refers to this, this, uh, this particular map in his diary. It's a map of the area around Selmenga, um, where he was uh, involved in fighting the first two weeks of July. The hand-drawn map on the right, I think, is probably by Captain Azarov, who was the commander of the battalion um, of the North Russian rifles, rifles to which uh, Scarf was attached. Um, and this is the area around Tulgas. Uh, and again, the diary tells us that Scarth and Azarov went uh, prospecting around there on the 5th of July, and this map is probably the result of their, their observations at that time. And there are other maps as well, less formal maps, just sketched into the diary on scraps of paper. Mapping was a very important part of the, of the campaign because uh, it seems as though they didn't have particularly good large-scale maps of the area. Um, it was very difficult terrain to see your way around because it was very heavily forested. Um, there were lots of deep ravines and so on. Um, and so making maps, finding good observation posts, uh, the tops of church towers and so on was, was kind of a preoccupation of the, uh, the officers. Um, so yeah, so this is a, uh, an opening from uh, Scarth's diary. There seem to be an unusual, unusually large number of diaries from this campaign, certainly among the British, Canadian, American, and Australian um, members of the Allied uh, forces fighting there. I think people realised that they were doing something unusual, going somewhere uh, exotic. I mean, this is the most northerly campaign the British Army's ever fought. Um, and and I, there seems to be a sense that people wanted to, to record their experiences up in, up in the north. Um, Scar's diary was written while he was up there in Russia, but usually uh, he writes several days up uh, at once. Um, so it's not, not strictly speaking a journal, but he does explain what happens uh, each day. Um, they're fairly brief diary entries, but you get a sense of, um, of Scar's humour. Uh, if I just read a few short extracts from, um, from the diary. 30th of June. Orders to move up to Topsa that night. Set out at 8 o'clock. The most comic procession. Nine drogas, which I think are a kind of um, carriage, um, and four servants running along behind. Held the whiskey tenderly wrapped up in a blanket on my knee the whole while, until we came to Topsa when I got out and carried it. The old droga nearly went off the bridge. 3rd of July. Went into a village in the morning and was terrified out of my life by an old woman. Um, 3rd of July. Two fellows from the Sadler Jackson Brigade 
uh, staff came up, spilt my jam. Damn. <laughs> um, so it's uh, a few kind of tongue-in-cheek entries, but at the same time, there's a palpable sense of, of fear. Um, shortly before Scarth arrived, there was a major mutiny um, in the North Russian Rifles, and there was also uh, a mutiny of the Slavo British Legion um, very close to where he was, and, and he records this on the 7th of July in the diary. A mutiny of Dyer's battalion at 3 a.m. Four British officers killed and wounded, and five Russian mutineers made for Troitsa and nearly did in General Grogan, who was tottering round in his pyjamas. About a hundred were captured. The rest joined the Bolo, that's the slang for the Bolsheviks, and took part in an attack on the 4th North Russian Rifles on the night, in the night when we lost position at Salmango. The officers were all murdered in their sleep, one having a Lewis gun shoved against his mosquito net. And the next day, um, Scott was on the march with his, uh, his Russian battalion. March started at 20.30 hours, made a long detour through the forest and lost position. Told them where they were, and was met by a shrug of the shoulders. One man committed suicide during the night. And I think when you're following straight on from that description of the, the British soldiers being murdered in their beds, I, I get a kind of sense that, that, that Scarth is kind of living in fear, and there are other um, days when he says, you know, rumours of mutiny is about to happen, and so on. So it must have been quite a, a terrifying place for this 20 year old officer to be. And but it's a strangely schizophrenic diary. I mean, he goes from these scenes of, of kind of fear and horror to 13th of July, went into Selmenga at about 10 and got a little puppy, one of a deserted litter of five, had a bad bite in its throat, but the doctor bandaged it up, and the next day the bite was practically okay. Fed the valley brute on condensed milk and was never so sticky in my life. Um, and I don't know whether it's just kind of military bravado, but the, 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 his, his ability to, 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 to do these, um, these kind of silly things in the midst of the battle is quite, quite striking. And you also get some insight into his, his kind of liminal role as a liaison officer, sort of there as a, a, a serviceman of the British Army, but also embedded with the, with the Russian battalion, and he peppers his account with, with Russian phrases and so on. Um, for historians of the conflict, perhaps the most interesting passage is the one in which he talks about um, Colonel Sherwood Kelly. Now, Sherwood Kelly was um, uh, a, kind of a double Victoria Cross holder, a very um, notable war hero, who was in charge of the, uh, the Second Hampshires, and on the... Um, 27th of June, I think it was. Um, no, I don't know uh, the 20th of June. Um, Sherwood Kelly was uh, had the task of um, taking the village of Troitsa as part of the, the Battle of Topsa, and um, and failed to do so. Or well, failed failed to hold on to it. Now later he became uh, a very public critic of the way the the war was being run. And actually, when he got back to Britain, he wrote to the Times complaining about the, the, the British generals and how they were conducting the war, and he was court-martialed for that um, breach of, of military discipline. And as a result, the kind of a more official histories, like General Ironside's memoirs, um, set out to denigrate Sherwood Kelly and say that on, on this occasion, for example, he failed to, um, to take the, this, this village that he was supposed to be attacking and he failed to, to give any fight. Um, in fact, Scarth's recollections at the time were that Sherwood Kelly did take the village of Troy, so it was forced out by heavy bombardment, which is confirmed by other um, kind of contemporary records. So this helps to, to kind of exonerate Sherwood Kelly from the way his reputation was, was blackened after the, after the war. Okay, now as well as the, the diary, we have quite a lot of photographs. Um, and these are not great photographs technically, um, I imagine Scarf probably had a simple sort of box camera, um, but they, they're a very good document of the context of the war uh, in, in intimate detail. So not the, the fighting itself, there were no kind of pictures of people firing guns or anything like that, um, but we get a sense of the world in which this war was being fought, a world that in some ways was destroyed by the war. So here we see Archangel 
cathedral here on the right, which was um, after was destroyed by the Soviets and uh, I believe is now being rebuilt. Um, and uh, again, just little scenes from, from daily life on the front. So we have um, some of the, the, the Barishni, the, the, the women who were employed by the British Army to do laboring work because they were found to be more hardworking and reliable than the, the men. Um, and this, I think, is a wonderful photograph. I don't know how well you can see it on the screen, but these faces kind of staring out at you from 100 years ago. Um, it's a great little picture. This is also a useful resource for fans of military hardware because there are various guns and ships, in this case, uh, a bomber, biplane bomber, it's the air code DH9 for those who collect these sort of things. Um, and a very, very crisp photograph, you can even, even read the serial number on the um, fuselage of the plane. And uh, Scarf has actually annotated the, the negative to say that this is at uh, the village of Kurgamen. Um, and some of these pictures were put into a photograph album. Uh, which scarf annotated. So we can actually identify some of the people in the pictures. Um, so here on the left we have, of course it doesn't say which name is attached to which of those figures, um, but it's General Miller, Yevgeny Miller, who was the head of the provisional government in Archangel, um, Colonel Pisarevich, his, uh, his adjutant, Prince Marusi, uh, who was a, the colonel who was in charge of the, uh, the Russian army on the Davina River. Uh, and uh, Captain Volkov from Archangel. Um, and then here on the right we have the officers of Scarth's own battalion. So these are the Russian officers that he'd served with, um, all smiling broadly. This is on the, the, the steamer that took them away from the front back up to the defensive positions in Archangel. Um, and so they're kind of a bit demo happy. And this, I think, in the centre is Captain Azarov, um, who was a commanding officer. And as well as, as these, um, Scarth also brought back a number of different souvenirs. And I've got a couple of photographs here from the exhibition which is currently on at Scale House, which I curated and which is running until the end of October, just to give that a plug. Um, there's some, uh, oh, this, this, this points, was not it? Yeah, there's some uh, brass icons, little brass icons there, and a wooden icon, I'll show you another image of that. The epaulettes um, here are those of a, a Russian uh, lieutenant colonel. And this marvellous thing is a, is a bashlik, which was part of the uniform of the, of the Cossack uh, regiments. Um, it has gold braid, which apparently uh, signifies that it was an officer's. And it's, um, it's made of camel hair, it's wonderfully fine and soft. And it's a, a big hood with these lappets hanging down that you can wrap around your neck uh, to keep the cold out. Um, and uh, there's obviously it's a Caucasian garment in origin, but there were a number of Cossacks in, in the kind of chaos of the Civil War who ended up fighting in, in North Russia. Um, and then visit, to visitors of Scale House, this is the most mm -hmm. famous artifact of the, uh, uh, the Civil War. This flag or banner, which was captured at the Battle of Lipovets, um, the, uh, uh, now, I understand it says the, the, the infantry battalion of the 4th Western Regiment, uh, and then there's, there's a word here at the end which is incomplete, which I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Um, it would have been red, it's now faded to a sort of muddy brown. Um, interestingly, it's got the, uh, the initials of the Russian Soviet Federalist Socialist Republic. Um, so this is before the amalgamation of the USSR, and if you can make out, this is also before the, the communist insignia was settled on as a hammer and sickle, so this is actually the, the hammer and plough. And the, the story in the Scarf family is that during the Second World War, when Colonel Scarf, as he then was, was um, in charge of civil defence for Orkney and Shetland, he had various distinguished visitors, including a, a Russian diplomat um, who came to see him. And his, as, as the Russian's car drove up the drive, he suddenly remembered that he had this um, uh, kind of uh, war booty on the wall. And he thought it might not be very tactful to, to display that. So um, 
his daughter was sent out to keep the Russians talking while they covered off the wall. Um, the, the, the icon here's a more detailed picture. Um, there's a, an icon in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was actually given to a Russian off, uh, to a British officer, by one of the um, monasteries in Archangel as a, as a thanksgiving for, for liberating them from the uh, Bolsheviks. Uh, I suspect this was probably bought. I mean, in his diary, um, Scarth talks sometimes about going into the villages and, and getting icons, uh, which I imagine means he was he was buying them. Um, it's it's Christ Pantocrator. Um, a bit hard to see now, probably blackened by smoke, and um, it would have had a, probably a silver cover called a Riza over the top, just showing the, the face and hands. And I think it, perhaps that's been taken off, causing some, some damage. Um, but uh, that's still a rather, rather beautiful thing. Um, and at the end of the campaign, Scarf was actually decorated by the Russians with the orders of uh, St. Stanislaus and St. Anne. So we have those medals as well. So these were all things that were brought back from, I'm not going for time, all right, mm -hmm. all right okay. <laughs> well, those were all things that were brought back from North Russia. After the, the campaign, um, Colonel Scarf wrote a short story in which he fictionalized his, um, his experiences in North Russia. And perhaps um, I'll, I'll maybe say, extend a comment on that in case there are any questions about it. Um, but this, this story was published in 1924 in a, in a charity anthology for the Balfour Hospital here in Kirkwall and has never been republished, but I think it's an interesting uh, piece of writing that maybe is, is worth rediscovering. Um, well, do, do tell us about it. Okay. okay. Uh, if you would like to hear, I'm just keeping to my orders from upstairs. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the, there's a character in it who's uh, uh, just simply described as the Britisher. He's not named, um, but is a British liaison officer, so someone in, in, in Scarth's role, uh, presumably, uh, in some respects, a, a, a self-portrait. And a battle is described which conflates events that happened at several of the battles that, that Scarth was involved in, but all things that he could have um, seen as, a, as an eyewitness. Uh, again, the sense of humour comes out. The, the story opens with uh, um, satirical caricature of a Bolshevik commissar, a um, very vain, uh, self-important man. And it's his, his downfall that is the, the main sort of event of the, um, of the story. But there are also, um, well, there's a one, one moment of stasis in the middle of this rather dramatic story, this wonderful lyrical passage, which I'll just read to you. Um, Evening wore on and the sun was beginning to set. The Briton, returning from his rounds, strolled into the church and made his way out onto the gallery round the top of the dome. The scene from here was beautiful beyond description. Far away to the north, the eye could follow the winding course of the Divina like a stream of molten gold pouring from the sinking sun itself. On either hand, on either hand the mighty forest came down to the river edge. The breeze ruffling its foliage through all the colours from black to vivid green. In the wide clearing round the village, one could detect little clusters of gaudy wooden houses denoting some quiet township, while in the distance on the other side of the river, the white walls of a church caught the rays of the dying sun and flung them back to the world with dazzling brilliance, its copper dome and spire gleaming green and gold above. Peasant women moved about on various tasks, bright spots of red and blue and yellow, from the troops below came at times wild and stirring choruses, at others sad and plaintive melodies in the peculiar weird cadences like the chants of a long dead religion which seemed so fitting to the atmosphere of dread mystery in which Mother Russia is steeped. The only thing missing from that of course is a, is a wooden cross. <laughs> So it has humour, it has lyricism, but this story also has cruelty. I mean, it doesn't shy away from the, the nastier side of the conflict. I mean, this was a very dirty war. Both sides used poison gas. Both sides probably used torture. Both sides shot prisoners. Um, and the, I don't think I'm giving anything away, so if I say the death of the commissar, um, I think may be based on a historical incident. 
um, the commissar is called Ivan Ivanovich, and there was a the, the leading commissar in, on, on the Divina was Grigory Ivanovich Samadyev, um, who was captured and killed by the British. And um, although he's not named in the, in the diary, um, Scarth mentions a couple of times seeing a, a dead commissar. Um, and this, this may be him. Most of what I found out about Samadyev actually comes from um, modern Russian communist websites. He's still regarded as a, as a kind of hero of the revolution. And I think, um, in terms of the, the, the English language literature of this conflict, there isn't a great deal. Um, there's, there's a book called The House by the Divina by Eugenie Fraser, um, a, a Scottish, plus Russo-Scottish lady who, was, who witnessed all this from the sidelines as a, as a schoolgirl. Um, several of the, the higher-ranking officers um, uh, wrote uh, memoirs. Um, General Ironside, the, 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 the British general, um, spends a lot of his memoir criticizing the, um, the, the Russian uh, uh, top brass. Generals Maraszewski and, and Miller from the Russian side also wrote memoirs in which they spent a lot of time criticizing General Ironside, which must give you some idea why the, the campaign ultimately failed in its, uh, its military objectives. Um, and Arthur Ransom, who was out in North Russia, um, collected old Peter's Russian tales, so folk tales from North Russia, which he published during the war. Um, but this, as far as I know, is the, is the only piece of um, uh, original fiction about this conflict written by a, a British eyewitness. Um, and I hope at some point to, to republish it and call it to people's attention. Um, so I'll just sort of wrap up by um, saying there's, there's a couple of ways in which this is not just a story about North Russia, but about Orkney. As I say, Scott was very familiar with Orkney. And as he sailed north on his way to Russia, he, he, he spotted the uh, meteorological hut on Houghton Head. Um, I haven't been able to find a picture of that structure, but this is a picture taken from it by Tom Kent, looking down over the, um, the German fleet in Scapa Flow. And then when he got to Archangel, Scarth um, gave his first impressions of the town. And this is where I get the title my paper. Um, first impression of the town, totally unlike what I expected. Very hot. Town made practically of wood. Roads perfectly unspeakable. Worse even than Orkney. And uh, this is there's a little, little picture of a, of a street market with these little woven birch bark um, baskets. Um, but you can see the, the cobbled road is in a pretty bad state even by Orcadian standards. Um, after that, um, the diary doesn't doesn't mention all these scars. was just kind of in, in this this world of the uh, of the, um, the campaign for the, for the next three months. Um, so as I say, the exhibition uh, uh, is on Scale House until October. Some of you may have seen it um, on the field trip. Um, and if anyone wants to know more, um, contact me. Hi. Thank you very much for watching. I've just got one question for you that's very straightforward. How long did this offensive last? Um, well, the, um, the, there was a British presence there from before the revolution, um, which, which just didn't, didn't go away. Um, and so September, October was when the, the British uh, troops were withdrawn. Some of the other countries had withdrawn their troops before that. And um, the in, in 1919, the, there was a very optimistic plan, um, which General Ironside managed to, to, to sell to Churchill, who was the, the Minister of War at the time, um, to connect the, the British and White Russian forces in North Russia with Admiral Kolchak's White Russian army in Siberia. Um, and this would have involved them both making huge advances of hundreds of miles um, and meeting at um, uh, Kotlas on the, on the river Dvina. Um and Churchill referred to this as the pumped through to Kotlas and, and it was on that basis that the relief force was sent out because they thought this was a possibility. Um, in fact Ironside was wildly exaggerating what, what was possible and in fact um, it's now clear that he knew, you know, he, was, he was kind of saying to his officers on the ground this will never work and then saying to Churchill oh yes just send us more men and, and we'll, we'll do it no problem. Um, one part of the problem with that is that the the Davina is quite a quite a shallow river, 
and in the summer it, it, it can get very low indeed. And 1919, as it happens, was one of the lowest um, years on record. And the, the, the ships of the British had their command simply couldn't get up the river far enough to, to make any meaningful uh, inroads. Um, and so it was, it was kind of, kind of doomed attempt to, to connect with the, um, with the Siberian forces. Um, by, by August, the, the aim, they, were, they had a more realistic aim of just pushing the, the front as far as they could and then retreating to defensive positions around Archangel, which it was hoped that the Russians on their own would be able to defend after the, the British withdrew. And in fact, even that didn't last very long. It was in spring 1920 that the, um, the, the Bolsheviks captured Archangel. Any other questions for me? Right. Well, thank you both for your lovely